Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Hey everyone, it's Mickey here. You're listening to Wikipedia, and this week on the podcast, I'm delighted to speak to returning guest Dr. Tommy Wood about cognition, the brain, and what we can do to support brain health. In the podcast, we discuss the environment today and the challenges to the brain that it brings that can be both protective but also potentially work against us. We also discuss how important genetics is in determining your disease risk profile when it comes to conditions such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and how lifestyle affects this risk. We discuss the paper that Tommy co-authored with Dr. Josh Turnkett that evaluated a lifestyle interventions that move the needle in terms of protecting the degeneration of our cognitive function. And we discuss the practical recommendations that come from this paper for anyone wanting to protect their brain as as they age. And we also discuss the link between muscle mass and brain health and so much more. I think you're really going to love this discussion. Anyone that knows Dr. Tommy Wood or has listened to him talk before or on the previous uh, episode that he was in, and we'll link to that in the show notes, uh, will know just what a wealth of information that Tommy is. So for those of you unfamiliar, Tommy Wood is part of the research faculty at the University of Washington in the Department of Pediatrics. His research focuses on ways to increase resilience of and treat injury of the developing brain. He has a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge, a medical degree from the University of Oxford, and a PhD in physiology and neuroscience from the University of Oslo. In addition to his role on faculty at UW, he serves as president of Physicians for Ancestral Health and is on the scientific advisory board of Hintzer Performance. Alongside his career in medicine and research, he's invested time in developing easily accessible methods with which to track human health, performance and longevity. He has published and spoken on multiple topics surrounding functional and ancestral approaches to health, including examining the root causes of multiple sclerosis and insulin resistance. He uses his experiences in coaching and competing in rowing, crossfit, powerlifting and ultra endurance racing to inform his day-to-day -day interaction with clients looking to achieve long-term health and performance. And we have linked the paper that Tommy and I discuss in the show notes to this episode. So before we crack on into the episode, I'd just like to remind you the best way to support the podcast is to hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast listening platform. That increases the visibility of the podcast out there and amongst the literally thousands of other podcasts. So more people get the opportunity to learn from guests that I have on the show. All right, team, please enjoy the conversation I have with Dr. Tommy Wood. And, um, and she's been helping me over the last couple of years and she has a, a mastermind group. That's what they call it. And, uh, and so we go and we do business stuff and, but I'm a big fan of beer. And so there are a lot of breweries and stuff around. So, yeah. um, I'll be doing brewery tours and I'm um, doing my business stuff basically. Okay. Yeah. You get so a bunch good. of like double hopped American IPAs and they'll have to roll you out of the country. The best. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get a, taste, a tasting paddle, Tommy. So I just uh -huh. sort of like, I like take little sips and I most of the time leave like quite a bit. Although my drink fitness is definitely improving. I can certainly get through more tasting paddles than <laughs> I used to You've been training your do. endurance. <laughs> I have been. And then my husband usually comes and like mind sweeps everything else and just like gets rid of it all uh but he's unfortunately not joining me so i'm right. gonna have to take drink me yourself yeah probably uh i'll take the hit it'll be fine some so of them are pretty are pretty lethal like a proper american ipa like starts at eight percent or something like they get pretty Tommy, intense i don't get out of bed for anything less than eight percent so okay um, all right well then <laughs> so you're gonna be I'm great primed. you're gonna be in good shape 
<laughs> I know it's not quite that bad, but I do. There's something really delicious about the high alcohol hops flavor mixes. And in fact, at our local brewery down here in Hobsonville in Auckland, New Zealand, they, um, the, the brewer, is it the, it's, it's a guy that does the brew brewing. Yeah. Anyway, he said he looks to the Americas for his inspiration. And I had no idea about that. No, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. Because they're much stronger than, say, English IPAs. They're like, oh, yeah. which are like four or five percent generally in America. They they're much stronger. I know, and then they get poured from like tepid, you know. And so you're drinking, and it's like, and I'm like, this is disgusting. Husband's <laughs> he's British, and he's like, this is a real beer, and I'm like, no way. Like, yeah, I, I will say that I am most partial to like a an English IPA, not like bitter like english bitter or lager like that's pretty boring but like a a nice yeah that's that but that's i guess that's what i grew up on (laughs) (laughs) basically is isn't it yeah yeah when i was 18 and my dad would take me to the local pub that had a really nice like ipa and that's what we would would sit and drink so Yeah. yeah yeah so just fond memories really yeah exactly yeah Delicious. Well, Tommy, um, I bet you, though, if we started talking about alcohol in the brain, you probably wouldn't deliver me such good vibes and good news about that, would you? Oh, yeah. Th- this isn't going on the show, right? Oh, yeah. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> now we all know your terrible beer choice, but hey, you can't help that. Um, but in all seriousness, though, of course, we are talking about the brain today. And uh, your portfolio your research portfolio sort of centers, as I understand it, on the neonatal brain, but we didn't really get an opportunity to talk about that last time that we spoke. Is your interest in the brain in general, is it emerged from your research in the neonatal brain? Has it been the other way around? How did that come about? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, So I started, by the first research I ever did in the lab was in a neonatal neuroscience lab in Bristol in the, in the UK as, as an undergrad. I was encouraged by one of my tutors at uni to apply for this sort of summer research scholarship thing, which basically g- gave you a few hundred quid to go and work in a lab somewhere and experience, experience research as like a summer intern kind of thing. And my mum didn't want me to be away from home for the summer So she like arranged that I could do this placement in the lab of a friend of hers. It was because, because she was, they were both professors at the university of Bristol. Um, So I was in this lab and did some little bits in some rat and piglet models of neonatal brain injury. Um, And then the sort of the professor who ran that lab encouraged me to go to medical school. Um, I was one of several people who encouraged me to go to medical school. And then, you know, a few years later, when I graduated and been working as a doctor for a while, she said, you know, why don't you come and do a PhD in my lab? So that's what I did, because I didn't really know what kind of doctor I wanted to be yet. Um, so I thought, oh, I'll just do a PhD for, for funsies. Um, and so that, that's what I did. And I moved to Norway to do that. She'd moved back to Norway. She's Norwegian. And so then, you know, that was really where the bulk of my formal neuroscience training comes from is from these animal models of neonatal brain injury and trying to find ways to treat uh, the injured newborn brain. Um, And sort of through all that time, right, I was an athlete myself, I was coaching athletes interested in, uh, you know, athletic performance, and then human health working with various groups with chronic health conditions, neurodegenerative conditions. Um, And over time, essentially, those seemingly disparate strands of my work have kind of merged together so i had my formal academic work that you know then formed the first uh, the sort of the basis of my postdoc and then my faculty position where i'm an, i'm an assistant professor of pediatrics and neuroscience that's my the title of my day job um but then i continued to work with athletes in various ways and uh, at one point was doing that full time uh, before i came back into academia and then eventually i sort of realized that all of these things kind of, to me, they, they all make sense. Like what happens early in life to your brain affects the trajectory of your brain health throughout your entire life. We don't normally think about it that way. We think about specific diseases, yeah, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, concussion. 
um, you know, these sort of preterm brain injury, which is what I spend a lot of time researching. We don't often or very rarely tie those strands together. And, and equally, we don't often acknowledge the fact that what's beneficial in one of those diseases or disorders is actually beneficial across all of them broadly. You know, the same sort of lifestyle and environmental factors that help stimulate growth and repair and recovery. Um, you know, they're actually very similar across the lifespan. So, so again, you know, different strands come together. What's important for long-term performance in athletes is very similar to what's important for long-term health in all people. And what's important for the brain in certain injury conditions is important for the brain more broadly. And all of those things are the same things. So that's how all these different parts of my work kind of come together. Yeah. And Tommy, do you think that it's because we're so siloed in how we think about these things, much as we might be in the medical system where you've got different surgeons work on different parts of the body? Do you think that different specialties or that there's a, not maybe not a lack of collaboration, but a lack of an understanding of the importance of collaboration? I'm not sure. So, yeah, that is absolutely it. There is, you know, I can speak m most uh, confidently about neuroscience, but it's certainly the case for other medical areas and biomedical areas that they are heavily siloed. And that kind of prevents people talking to each other a little bit. Some of it is by, des well, some of it is as a result of design, not that people intended things to be siloed, so there was no collaboration. But, you know, you have, um, if you're trying to fund research into neurological conditions, you want to make sure that there's sort of a, a balance of where that money goes, right? If you just had like one big neuroscience pot, maybe all of it would end up in Alzheimer's disease, and then nobody gets any money to study neonatal brain diseases, right? So then you like, you siphon off the pot. So you have a, a pot for babies and a, and a pot for children and a pot for traumatic brain injury, right? But then what that means is it sort of focuses people on just that disorder. And what we've been doing more and more of is going deeper and deeper and deeper into the cell. Like we did, you know, uh, like the molecular stuff. We did stuff about organelles. Then we did genetics. Now we're doing like single cell transcriptomics and proteomics. Like what is this one single cell type in this one... Uh, part of one region of the brain and one species doing in response to one specific thing. Like we know a lot about that, but very few people are then zooming out to say, hey, how does this then actually relate to what's happening in humans or these other people? So I think some of it's due to how we fund these things. Um, and then also our drive for like higher and higher levels of data and novelty and fancy things to get things published in fancy journals. When in reality, if I tell you that like the most important thing, which is what we're going to talk about, the most important thing for long-term brain health is to like cognitively stimulate that brain. Yes. Right? That's not very exciting, is it? You know, <laughs> who's going to give gonna... you money to tell you that? But who's going to give you money to tell you that? Because it's, it's funny because I truly believe that this is the most critical factor yeah. in long-term brain health. And we can talk yeah. about all the different reasons why. Mm -hmm. um, but when you tell somebody that, 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 they're like, oh, yeah, of course. That makes sense. Like, didn't didn't we know that? Didn't didn't we know that? Didn't we know that, that was important? I'm like, yeah, but we don't do it. So there's a disconnect. Yeah, and do you think as well that people's understanding of what demanding is might also play a, a role? For example, like I do a cryptic crossword. Oh yeah, that's such a oh. lie. I start a cryptic crossword, <laughs> <laughs> and I spend about two minutes, and then I'm like. I can't get that first clue. Or if I do, that encourages me to further on. But I'm sort of yeah. you know, using my brain a bit. Um, other people might do Wordle or they do Sudoku or whatever that thing is that people used to do. But I don't know how many people do that anymore. And this is our understanding. A lot of people do that kind of thing to help with keeping their brain young and active. Is hmm. that enough? Is that demand enough? No. There's a short answer. And I, you know, I do have a bunch of studies to tell you that. But I think, again, if you know, I'd sort of, when I'm draw, trying to draw some ideas about how these things kind of make sense, you sort of like build like a, a model of how this thing works. I think about what do we know is really important for developing the brain in the first place, right? So I'm going to bring in my neonatal neuroscience bit here. And what are the things that babies do as they develop their brain, right? They develop complex motor skills. Trying to manipulate 
a, a meat sack in 3D space <laughs> at, at speed. Mm. Really hard. Really, <laughs> yeah. really hard to do that, right? Yeah. Uh, language skills, social interaction. These are really complex skills that require you to try really hard and fail a lot um, in order to get better over time. So if we then think about, so I, I think about this like trajectory over the life of the the kind of stimulus we give our brains. So the first few years while we're developing motor skills, social skills, language skills, things like that, a huge amount of stimulus is put into the brain. And then there's also a, a ton of time to actually respond to that. And what you require is like nutrients and sleep, right? So babies crawl, walk, fall over, try, try again, get frustrated, have a nap, right? And that's where consolidation and recovery and those kinds of repair happen. In adults, we do less and less difficult things over time because the things that we do every day become habits and become automatic, like learning how to drive a car, very hard to start, eventually becomes automatic. It's no longer a stimulus. And it's the same with the things we do at work, right? We think we're cognitively challenged at work. And actually, there is a lot of evidence that the most cognitive challenge that we do get is through our work. Um, but relative to these other inputs, it's quite, you know, answering emails and sitting in meetings, that's not the same as learning how to walk, right? In terms of difficulty. Um, so to kind of answer your question, there is some evidence for things like word games. Uh, there's, there's some much better, um, like bra like online brain training, brain HQ has, uh, you know, a, a very well-developed platform has been used in tons of studies and it does seem to be it translates over to important things like working memory and executive function, which is what you care about, right? You don't care about how good you are at a brain training game. You care about how you function out in the real world and so that does have some trans translation across um but more important things that seem to be particularly protective are like skill-based movement language uh, learning a musical instrument these are complex usually social tasks that require you to kind of practice fail be bad slowly get better over time and then the other side of that is you need some period to kind of rest and recover and, and repair and consolidate. So I do a Wordle every morning, but I don't think that that's what's going to prevent me from getting cognitive decline later in life because it's not challenging enough. Okay. Okay. Do you also post about it on Twitter? No. Oh. I don't post about anything on Twitter because Twitter is a nest of vipers. I, <laughs> okay. Um, I stalk Twitter. So I, I, I do follow Twitter because like people post important yeah. science papers and stuff i think it's great interacting with people on twitter like gives me chest pain so yeah, I, I, don't, I don't bother doing it <laughs> okay okay good um so tommy if i because i i want to uh talk to you about the interventions that we know help with um sort of cognitive function and and i know obviously your paper with dr josh Turknet. thank you um uh you know really delved into that and i found it super interesting but what i first want to ask you is sort of this is a little bit bringing in your research portfolio, is there anything that has changed in our environment that changes that very early complex pattern, uh, complex learning in an infant? Do we know anything about that? Like anything sort of epigenetically going on about what a baby might be exposed to or an infant or a fetus is exposed to that might impact that? might impact what like that very early stages of learning for example i i i want to ask you about you know school age children and, and how that might have changed with their brain over time but what you were describing with sort of learning to walk and and that kind of stimulus seems very it seems like not a lot may have changed in our modern environment to sort of change that but has anything changed mm. preterm that could impact on the development of a kid so are you asking about things that have, have changed in society more recently that may be impacting like yeah. long-term yeah. trajectory? Yeah what, we, yeah, what do we know epigenetically, I suppose, of things that are going on with pregnant women or the lifestyles they lead? Does any of that impact on that very early stage growth and development of a neonatal brain? Yes. So... I have some colleagues and with, with, you know, I'm also involved in, in, in some research that looks at, you know, what's you know, maternal health and then 
sort of like the neurodevelop- neurodevelopment of of their babies. And and often when we're looking at it, it's in at risk babies. So say babies born preterm. And just to kind of orient people, if you're born preterm, it's you depending on the definition, it's either before 35 or 36 weeks of gestation. So average gestation, everybody says nine months, 40 weeks is is what what we tend to use. So if you get you know less than 90% of that, um, that's considered preterm. And the more preterm you are, the greater the risk of some kind of neurodevelopmental impairment. And that could be, you know, they measure this a bunch of different ways, but like motor skills, language skills, co- cognition, cognition skills or cognitive skills. And right now, what we think of, you know, we think is like the limit of viability is basically you can get to maybe 21 weeks and be born and survive. Um, although the risk of having cerebral palsy or some kind of significant impairment is is very high. The majority of infants will either die or have uh, born at that age, what either die or have some kind of impairment if they survive. And this is important because the rate of preterm birth is actually increasing. We're not having more preterm births, but a greater proportion of the births that we're having are preterm. So in the US, about 10% of babies are born preterm. Um, and that's been slowly creeping up. And then there are a bunch of things that increase the likelihood that you'll have a baby that's born preterm. So um, like maternal health, uh, gestational diabetes, uh, maternal body composition, but then also maternal race, which seems to be linked to systemic discriminatory factors. So there's some very nice work done by a guy called Jimmy Collins, um, who's shown that um, black mothers, the more that they're exposed to racial discrimination, increases their risk of preterm birth. So it's probably like a systemic stress effect. And this then may have like an epigenetic effect that passes down uh, across generations. So that's something that's certainly still prevalent. And, and then, you know, overall, the health of the population is deteriorating. And those deteriorations in health are happening earlier. And that's affecting maternal health, which is then increasing the risk of preterm birth and some of these other things. Um, so I think as the health of the population d- sort of decreases, that's that's also maybe driving some of these things like even before um, even before uh, conception, because paternal health also seems to be playing a role. There's been some interesting studies on the health of the dad, what medications he takes, how that affects sperm quality. Maybe that then affects the the infant once they're born as well. So, kind of this overall downward trajectory of of health in in Western modernized populations seems to be compounding over time. Oh, that was a bit depressing, wasn't it? <laughs> well, I feel yeah, like where to from here? Should we just wrap it up? Is it like <laughs> <laughs> done and dusted? Um, now, interesting though about that paternal health because that's often not something that we focus on. And I, and obviously, uh, or at least I don't think it's your research. But do you have any um, uh, information on the types of medications that could impact? Like, is this a well-known thing that I'm just completely? No, it's with? not. And I'm not going to. There is. I'm not going to mention any in particular because I don't think the research is in a good enough place to to say say one way or another. Just that it's something that people are looking into. Yeah, okay, I know that's super interesting. And then Tommy sort of has shifted up an age um, bracket, I suppose, um, to like kids these days and the type of stimulus that they have with regards to the environments they live on, it's live in. It's quite different from when I was young and clearly no devices. Your parents just told you to go outside and come back at dinner time, that kind of thing. And we were sort of exposed to whatever the environment you know that we that we were in um how has the environment changed potentially that sort of brain health trajectory of just kids in that sort of school age yeah it's a good question because like there's no denying that the type of stimuli that our brains are exposed to nowadays are just very different from what they were you know, even like every 10 years, it changes, changes completely. So even compared to what we were exposed to as kids, you know, the the undergrads in my lab, right, they they grew up in an environment where smartphones were like the norm. Whereas, you know, I have one of those crappy old Nokias that I could play snake on (laughs) when I wasn't paying attention in English class, right? So it's just, there's a very different type of stimulus. And there's obviously a lot of um, questions around screen time, and those kinds of things and how they affect the brain. And there are some, there's some interesting research there, I, I think that, um, but but a, a number of things interact. So I don't think it's all 
bad news. I've given a lot of bad news. I don't think it's all bad news because there are, like, there are some interesting studies in mice where they like take mice and then they put they they do some of that at the University of Washington with and they have this model of like hyper stim- stimulation where they so that the mice are in their little cages after they're born and they're exposed to they play cartoons the noise from cartoons and then they flash colored lights like continuously so it's kind of like kids watching cartoons all day and then later on they see that these mice have like uh, they look more like sort of ADHD hyperactive kind of inattention type. Um, phenotype as they get as they get older and so like this makes you think oh no all of this is terrible but there are some other things that i think come into play so when you're spending all your time watching screens you're also sedentary um generally and we know that physical activity particularly for the at-risk brain is incredibly well is is important in general but there are some studies in say babies born preterm the more um motor skills they develop and the more muscle mass they develop, the better their cognitive function and the better their executive function. So you can overcome some of these risk factors by being more physically active, developing more motor skills. Um, so I think you can, and then there was a, there was another study that, that I think just came out last week that looked at uh, screen time on uh, certain uh, behavioral factors in children. And they found that it could be moderated if those kids spent more time outside. So you know, again, sort of outside playing. So like, so a, r- a range of stimuli, not just sitting and watching screens being sedentary all day. If you then do other things, like you get to play outside, you're physically active, you know, all these other things, I think, come into play. So we sort of like focus on, you know, screens are really bad. But actually, I think if you build in those other things as well, the majority of that risk probably diminishes. Um, and equally, you might think about, you know, societal factors, what are the kids that, you know, only have the opportunity to sit inside and look at screens all day versus those who, whose parents have the time and the availability to take them to sports classes and play outside and other things, right? So there's some societal stuff that I think plays into those risk factors as well. And interestingly, I don't think screens are all necessarily bad news. Whenever I talk about cognitive stimulus, people always ask me about video games. That seems to be the one thing um that comes up again again and actually my my now great claim to fame is that the paper that josh and i wrote um joe rogan talked about it on his podcast as an excuse really? for playing video games <laughs> really have you been on joe you haven't been on joe rogan yet, I, have you? I haven't uh but i imagine he listens to your show so joe i'm waiting for an <laughs> invite um but the the what so there are there you can you can think of a a a scenario where video games are actually positive stimulus for the brain right there's often problem solving fine motor skills reaction time you know all those and there's there's often a social component even if it's remote right you're talking to people interacting with others so there was actually a study again done in kids that looked at those who were and weren't gamers and found some benefits in terms of cognitive function in the kids who played video games so again that doesn't mean that you should spend all your time playing video games. But if you get some of that stimulus, in addition to those other things, you also get time outside, time with other people, time being physically active. I think we can balance, you know, get benefit from some of these more modern uh, developments, you know, as long as we're then keeping some of these, you know, baseline things that we know are important for for long-term health. But do you know what? People listening to this are probably all going to be like, have like a, massive sigh of relief and they're not going to feel like the worst parents (laughs) in the world that their kids play video games because of how you've just described it and it and you know it is interesting because it absolutely makes sense yeah that having that additional stimulus isn't necessarily all a bad thing if you've got those other things sort of in place yeah and 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 we know that Anytime you focus on one very specific, you ask the brain to do one very specific thing again and again and again, you will start to sacrifice other aspects of cognitive function. It's the same as, right, if I train to be a powerlifter and, you know, I want to be a high level powerlifter, I'm going to be a terrible marathon runner. Like, right. And Mm -hmm. I've, I've asked my body to be very good at one specific thing. And the brain is the same. So that's why I think a diversity of inputs is, is really important. So if all you're good at, is playing Call of Duty, you're going to see some detrimental effects in other aspects of cognitive function. So, you know, get a smorgasbord of inputs and and continue to get better at all of them over time. And I think that's really a recipe for success. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, related, but a bit of a tangent. 
why do people say things like, we only really ever use 10% of our brain? <laughs> like, um, I don't know. I just thought of that. Like, and then I'm thinking, oh, are we just engaging more of our brain? Like, like what's the deal with that? whole thing yeah it's 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 a good it's a good question and i I can't say i ever really got to the root of i'm I'm sure there's like some study that on one metric that's the case so if you did like a functional (laughs) you do like an ffm an fmri a functional mri and you look at which areas of the brain are active on specific tasks right not the whole brain is active at all times maximally right yes so that makes sense um there's another way to interpret it only 10 percent of the cells in the brain are neurons. So, ah, right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so that could be it, right. We're only yeah. like, if you're that, you know, that, that, that could be something related. Um, but in reality, <clears throat> just like any other tissue in the body, if you're not using it, you will sacrifice it. Like yeah. the brain is exactly the same. Like, like a, like if you have built up a bunch of muscle tissue and then you're bed bound, that muscle is going to waste away because it's metabolically expensive and you're not using it. And the brain is essentially the same. So if you were only using 10% of your brain, your brain would be 90% smaller. Yeah. Really. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Now, so Tommy, that actually does um, lead into the relationship between muscle mass and the brain. And I know that you're very interested in this area as well. Can we talk about that relationship? Because I feel like people don't, for whatever reason, people just don't get it. Like they don't prioritize their physical sort of muscle mass health um in order to help with their brain and maybe they're not aware of that relationship which is actually quite possible yeah so there's a number of relationships that that go on in this and it's not just like unfortunately i wish i could tell you that just like the more jacked you were the smarter you would be (laughs) um unfortunately that's not not the case and you know i've even done some of these analyses myself to to show that um n equals one (laughs) right I'm right. big and I'm smart, therefore, um, <laughs> yeah. it must be correct. Um, so if we sort of like zoom out a little bit, we know that muscle mass in general is a pretty good predictor of longevity, say yeah. like a, a hard outcome of are you going to die or not? And that's generally not a more is better kind of thing. It's just a don't have very little. So it, it's yes. kind of like a, a less is less kind of thing, not a more is more. So you kind of want to be in like the top 50% of the population in terms of muscle mass. And then that's enough to kind of protect against mortality. When you look at cognitive function, it's a little bit um, more complicated than that. Um, There are definitely studies that show in older individuals, randomized control trials, that if you randomize them to a strength training intervention, and it's something super simple, like three times a week, six exercises, three sets of eight. Anybody can do it. 45 minutes, machines in any gym, right? Nothing complex. And doing that intervention for six months significantly improves certain aspects of cognitive function. And then they do MRIs and show like improved connectivity. It's particularly good for the white matter in the brain, which is is like the relay station. Uh, it's like the fast relay between different you know uh, levels of the brain. So we know we can intervene in people who haven't lifted before, improve their, you know, and with the improvement in strength, the muscle mass comes an improvement in uh, cognitive function and brain structure. There are probably two sets of reasons for that broadly. One is a direct neuromuscular stimulus, right? You're asking different things of your brain in order to drive this use of the muscle tissue. And that bidirectional thing probably strengthens certain connections in the brain. But then we also know that when you exercise muscle tissue, it releases a whole bunch of stuff that's really good for our brains and our bodies, you know, broadly termed myokines. Although I was just I was just in, um, having a conversation with uh, Andy Galpin uh, and we, oh, yes. we were like reading a paper together and like somebody's coined the term exokines, which I hate. Don't say that. It's a stupid word. Myokines right. is just things released by muscle tissue when, when you do movement. Um, and there's a bunch. E- what, what are exokines? So they're, they're the same thing. It's just like a new term that somebody came oh, up with for like things okay. that, sorry, I kind of jumped to why I hate it without explaining why. Um, <laughs> no, when you no, exercise, no. Mm. when you exercise, your muscle tissue releases stuff. Um, exokines. No, ex- it's exokines. Like oh, ex- exercise, oh, like exokines. Weird. Yeah, right? Yeah, um, yeah, right? We already had a word for it. It was called myokines. Yeah. And we've had that for a long time. Anyway, okay. so myokines are released. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's released, like lactate uh, is, yeah. seems to be beneficial for the brain in a number of different ways. So 
that's the so the two levels, like the direct stimulus, and then as well as things that the muscle releases when when you train it. Um, if you then look at say population studies, so I've done a bit bit of this. I'm working with some some students to to write up a paper right now. So we have some physical activity data. So this is from a, a, a national data set here in the US, NHANES. We have some physical activity data, some muscle mass data, uh, some uh, strength data, and then uh, some cognitive function data. And what it seems to show is not that like more muscle is better for your cognitive function. It's that your muscle is beneficial through better strength, which basically tells me that having more muscle function is what's really important. And that's probably because that muscle is being used. So you're getting release of myokines. And it's also giving you that di direct neuromuscular stimulus. So more muscle is probably only useful if it's functional and it's sort of been developed through the process of stimulating the muscle directly. Because there are other ways that you can gain muscle, just like if you gain weight in general, some of that will be muscle tissue. But that's probably not the same as gaining that muscle through exercise, which is then going to have those those effects on the brain. So more muscle isn't necessarily better for cognitive function, but if it's associated with an improvement in function, that's when you're then going to get some of that benefit. Yeah. Tommy, do we know much about sort of muscle mass across the lifespan and the brain benefits? And where I'm thinking is obviously as a I don't know, it seems obvious to me, but as a reservoir for glucose, then that changes that disposal. So there's less of a high blood sugar environment that could negatively impact. Like, is there anything there? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, most of it is is, cor is correlations, right? So we know that the more muscle you have and the more you move it, the better a glucose sink it is. So even for the same amount of muscle tissue, if you move it more, that muscle becomes a bigger sink for, for glucose. So it's both like a, a mass and an activity um, kind of function. And there's plenty of data that shows that as you get older, muscle uh, mass decreases, cognitive function decreases, and glucose regulation uh, decreases. And we also know that if you're, uh, say, you have normal blood sugar versus pre-diabetic versus diabetic, the worse your blood sugar control, the faster your cognitive function declines. So all of this stuff kind of comes together to say that, yeah, probably having enough muscle tissue and making sure you move it regularly is going to improve blood sugar control. And we can see that acutely in studies as well. You can see uh, improvements in, in blood sugar regulation in people with poor blood sugar control just by getting them to exercise. But it has to happen every day. You have to, you know, it's like continued. It's sort of like an in the moment improved um, uh, glucose regulation. The only way to sort of improve it long term at baseline is to improve body composition. For the same body composition, you can improve your blood sugar control just by moving more. So all of it kind of comes together to say, yeah, you should have enough muscle tissue and you should move it regularly. And that's going to improve your blood sugar control. And it's very likely that that's then going to decrease the risk of cognitive decline. Yeah, which of course then makes me think about the fact that was it 93% of the US population that have poor metabolic health yeah something like that yeah 80 yeah. 88 to 95 percent, something like that yeah mate and so this obviously does not bode well for cognitive decline as we age would it no and this de depending on who you ask the, the metabolic health of the population is sort of decreased over time and with it you know we've seen in the last really 10 to 20 years this huge increase in Alzheimer's disease as a cause of death um, in the UK, and now that you know, in the UK, it's one of the top causes of death. In the US, it's it's climbing, and it's it you know it increases every year. So, as overall metabolic health of the population has decreased over the last few decades, out you know Alzheimer's disease as one form of dementia, you know, has really seemed to to increase at the same time. <laughs> we can't prove that they're directly linked, but for a number of reasons, we might think that they're almost certainly related. Yeah. And Tommy, with Alzheimer's, I used to think that um, the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's is whether or not you've got a family history of it. So if your grandfather has it, your father or whatever, then you are much more likely to get it. Is that the case? Is it is there this is the genetic sort of component of Alzheimer's really the strongest sort of predictor of it now? So what's interesting, uh, interesting to me. And actually, this is the case for a number of chronic diseases. You know, obesity is another one that I've seen talked about 
you know, in, in this way a lot just just this week, is that because something runs in a family doesn't mean that it's genetic. Um, and that's because of shared environments are probably the biggest driver. So if we think about Alzheimer's disease or age-related dementia, because Alzheimer's disease technically, as described by Alzheimer, originally is a, a monogenic you know, uh, disease of like you know, one, one mutation and one gene that causes a very early and rapid decline in cognitive function. That's not the type of Alzheimer's disease we're talking about, which occurs much later, is much more variable from person to person, it's much harder to predict. And it's largely driven by the environment. So that type of Alzheimer's disease, there is a genetic component. Your genetics probably determine up to 10% of your risk. So then the other 90% is stuff that's potentially modifiable. However, your genes may tell you something about the types of environments that you're susceptible to, because if you have genes that run in your family and your family has a, a history of Alzheimer's disease and also has a common environment, then there's there's probably some interaction there that we're not yet at a place that we can like really describe really well. Um, but you know, the things that your grandparents ate and do and your parents ate and do and you eat and do, they're probably quite similar. And so that's, you know, when risk comes in families, my guess is the majority of that is due to shared environments rather than shared genetics, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally does. So it sort of means that whilst you if you stay within that environment, your trajectory could well go down that same path, but it's not definitive that it will. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what about APOE4, Tommy? Yeah. Like there are, I know that there are pe like people really hot on it and seem to spend all of their time trying to ensure that they're not like, um, that they're doing everything favorable, which is probably a good thing because it's probably yeah. favorable for a lot of other things. What is it that we know about? Well, can you, First, describe for people who aren't aware of the APOE4 gene, the sort of the risk involved there, and um, what we what we do and don't know. Yeah, so apolipoprotein E, it's a it's a lipoprotein, so it's a protein that's part of uh, circulating uh, lipids around the body, and there are three different genotypes: APOE2, three, and four. And because it's a gene, you can have uh, you have two copies of your you have two copies of an ApoE gene, so you can have either one or two, and a combination of two, three, and four. ApoE four is probably the the oldest one historically. Uh, it's been around the long the longest in the human line lineage, and in people who have one copy of ApoE four, they maybe have a you know two or three times, maybe up to five or six times increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And if you have two copies, it's more like six to eight up to 20 fold uh, increase in, in risk. However, I mean, that sounds quite scary. However, well, yeah. And, and that's how it's sold to people. Um, however, people who have one or two copies of, of, of ApoE4 aren't destined to get Alzheimer's. And most people who have Alzheimer's don't have ApoE4. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's more important. And your APOE genotype overall probably determines maybe 4 to 5% of your risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are different ways that we can interpret how important it is. So you're right. Some people may test it, see that they're APOE4, know that they're at a slightly increased risk, and then they do everything in their, you know, um, in their power to improve everything. And, you know, in that scenario... I would not worry about your ApoE4 at all, right? Yeah. Because I think the vast majority of your risk is still driven by lifestyle and the environment, regardless of your genetics. Um, other people, and you know, this is well borne out in the genetics literature, you may say, hey, you have Apo, you know, one or two copies of ApoE4, you're at increased risk. What happens is that person then gets stressed about their risk, but makes no changes. So you've done a net negative thing for that individual by telling them that they're at increased risk, but not changing their risk other than increasing it by causing them chronic stress and this is so it really depends on the person how they respond to that kind of information so this is not something that you should just test and tell people and leave them to it because there's you know that you know overall the genetic literature there was a nice meta-analysis that came out a few years ago says if you tell pe people about their genetics it doesn't change their behavior but what it may do is increase their stress so so it may may actually be better for you to not know um there are also some populations where apoe4 
is not associated with cognitive decline or Alzheimer's disease. So three studies that I know of are in the Bolivian Simene, the Nigerian Yoruba, and then in a group of indigenous Americans here in the US. The way I interpret that is, yeah, okay, maybe those populations have other protective genetic factors that counterbalance it, or these are individuals who are living in an environment with a lifestyle that's more similar to that which their ancestors lived in, right? It's the, maybe more, you know, I think in general, they have fewer of the you know negative potential negative effects of a, of a modern lifestyle that is that that may be driving risk in the setting of of ApoE4, which they then don't have. So I, I think either way, regardless of your genetics, it, the risk is really driven by the environment. That's how I, I interpret um, the ApoE4 data. Yeah. Okay. And you know, with your paper with um, uh, Josh Turnkit, Turnkit, um, Turnkit, <laughs> damn. It's like uh, it's like uh, Brett and Brent for me, and uh-huh. Christy and Kirsty always get them mixed up. Anyway, um, <laughs> you guys nicely outlined those interventions that could help with that cognitive demand that we were talking about earlier, and help sort of protect the brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you laid it out on the table, and you've sort of had the levels of evidence maybe for each of those yeah. things. Can can you tell me sort of describe? what you were looking at with demand coupling, like, cause I found that, you know, just describe what that term sort of means. And then also just talk a little bit more about those interventions and, and how people, how, you know, me sitting here might actually find, oh yeah, I could actually, this is something that might be quite valuable. Yeah. So demand coupling is basically an, an idea that says the function of any tissue or organ in the body is proportional to the demands placed on it, plus some opportunity to recover and repair from it. Um, that sounds a little abstract. Um, people will maybe better understand the idea around exercise. If you want to get bigger and stronger muscles, you have to apply you know, mechanical tension to them. Um, muscular tension and or maybe some metabolic stress, Right, those are the things that drive muscle growth and and muscle strength. So you can imagine a scenario where your sleep is amazing, your diet is amazing, your social interaction is amazing, you're not exposed to any significant stresses or pollution or to- like anything like that. But you're not going to get bigger and stronger unless you go to the gym. Right? Yeah. yeah? So you could have everything in place to have optimal mus- muscle health, but if you don't actually work the muscle, it's not going to improve its function. Um and the brain is essentially the same, right? So we can have amazing sleep, an amazing diet. Um, you know, we can do it, do a, some, maybe we're doing a, a little bit of Sudoku or something, right? All this stuff is great. No toxins in the environment, like none of that stuff. But unless you actually challenge your brain, it's not going to improve its function. And so this is, I think, the problem that we've had with a whole bunch of interventions in Alzheimer's disease is like, Oh, we we gave these people fish oil and their cognitive function didn't improve. Or, you know, we gave these people uh, this multivitamin, their cognitive function improved. We gave these people this antibody against amyloid, their cognitive function didn't improve. But at no point are you stimulating the tissue to improve its function. Uh, And so that really, in my mind, is this critical missing piece. So we don't know if those interventions don't work. It's it's like saying, um, I slept a bit more, therefore I should grow more muscle tissue without going to the gym. That doesn't make any sense. Um, so so that's really what demand function uh, coupling is. And it seems to be critically important in the brain. And, and the other side of it, which people don't, I think, appreciate in the same way either, is that when you stimulate a tissue, not only do you stimulate like growth and connectivity and function, but you also stimulate repair and recovery. So the best way, you know, you know, you know, uh, fasting is really is is really big for autophagy right now. You know, so you, you stimulate this like processes where you start to break down these janky old proteins and recycle them, and you rejuvenate the cells. The fastest way to stimulate autophagy in any tissue is aerobic exercise. So it's not restricting uh, calories. It's not restricting nutrients. It's stimulating those tissues that drives autophagy much more than restriction. And the brain is essentially the same. If you want to, there are you know, tons of studies done in different injury models in different species that show that if you stimulate the brain, you upregulate autophagy and repair and recovery. 
So not only are you stimulating function, you're also stimulating, you know, the sort of adaptation and recovery. So that's essentially demand function coupling. And so then to kind of zoom out from the biochemical and the and the theoretical, um, the interventions we talked about, and we can talk about each of them in 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 turn if you want. We talked about physical activity. So we talked about why that might be beneficial. Uh, music, language. Um, you know, when it comes to physical activity, those, you know, to, to go back, those that have a coordination component seem to be most protective. So when your body is kind of challenged in its orientation in 3D space, that's a much greater stimulus because it's sort of like, it's almost like an existential threat, like being able to orientate your your yourself uh, in space. So that's like a greater stimulus that seems to have more benefit. Um, then there's also nice evidence from uh, re retirement data. So basically, in multiple populations, the earlier you retire, the earlier your cognitive function declines, because that's probably work is um, where the most cognitive stimulus seems to come from in the modern uh, environment. Then there's data from senses and sensory loss. So if you have uh, hearing loss, uh, or you have a cataract, say, then you're at increased risk of cognitive decline or dementia. But it's reversible. So if you then get a hearing aid or you get cataract surgery, then your your risk disappears. So at all these different levels, you can see stimulating the brain um, decreases risk. If we remove a stimulus, risk increases, but it's reversible, right? So it's not that your brain is this fixed thing that's only going to get worse over time. We can recover and improve if we then provide the right stimuli. One thing we didn't include in the paper, we probably should have done, is uh, meditation and mindfulness because there are there is some um, there is some evidence that those are they they may partly be stimulating certain aspects of the brain, but they could equally also be augmenting that sort of recovery process from the stimulus itself, like decreasing chronic chronic stresses that may inhibit recovery. That that may be part of the process as well, and then. You know, stimulate and then sleep. Sleep being, you know, obviously absolutely critical. I've got to be honest. I wish I would talk to an expert that would say something like, oh, sleep, yeah, sure, whatever. There are other <laughs> more important things. I don't think that's ever going to happen. C can I say, though, that yeah. I will, you should speak to so a good friend of mine who's a circadian biologist, Greg Potter. Have you had him on your show? Yeah, he was like, I think, number one or two oh, okay. or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and I think... Greg's message about sleep is, is the most accurate as well as being quite accessible, which is that we're probably not having this big, like sleep is critically important, right? And, and he'll give you all the tips on how to improve your sleep. But this sort of like everybody has to sleep eight to nine hours a night, mm. it's not true. Um, and equally, I think as we become hyper-focused on sleep data, everybody's like now stressed out because they're always going to tell them they slept poorly. And and or just like change the algorithm and all of a sudden everybody's sleep data are different, right? So like there are a number of reasons why the way that we focus on sleep is is probably increasing risk rather than decreasing it because we're relying on poor quality data. We're expecting ourselves to sleep an amount that maybe we don't need to. Like dementia risk doesn't seem to really increase below uh until you get like below six hours of sleep chronically, which is probably a lower number than, than most people might hear. So mm. Sleep is critically important, but it's not all bad news. Okay. Oh, that's great, Tommy. The way that you described that made me think of what you were describing with understanding or knowing your genetic profile and mm. then not doing anything about it, then just stressing, and that's just terrible. Yeah. So not too dissimilar from sleep then. What yeah. Was good or, news, orth actually? Orthosomnia is the word that people are throwing around now. <laughs> well, that's good because I know so many uber healthy people um, I, you know like that you know they enjoy the outdoors they eat really well they don't drink much you know at all and you know they're super healthy but they absolutely stress about their sleep and in fact they are the type of personality that likes to uh slightly perfectionist so so that then sort of heightens that stress for them so um i'm gonna let them know what your sort of um synopsis was of that tell them to listen to it um tommy you mentioned music. Uh -huh. does, lis does listening to music count or is it actually playing a musical instrument? So there are probably some benefits to just listening to music, but some of the, the best evidence come from those who play music yeah. um, and play a musical instrument. There's a really nice study um, that used this metric called brain age, which is this machine learning algorithm that you, so if you take an MRI of your brain and you give it to this algorithm and you say, how old does this brain look? 
and it's been it's been used in probably dozens of studies at this point. And um, what they what they found was that compared to people who don't play a musical instrument, musicians have younger looking brains than their brain is in like chronological years. So oh, wow. musicians have younger looking brains, but amateur musicians have a bigger benefit than professional musicians. And their theory was that for an amateur musician, playing an instrument is harder, right? Yes. Once you're a professional, it's not as hard anymore, right? We talked about things that become habit, things that become automatic. It's no longer a stimulus. So amateur musicians gain the greatest benefit in terms of how young their brains look because they're doing something that's harder to do. It's a greater stimulus uh, for the brain. So playing a musical instrument is a great way, you know, you know, playing it maybe even in a social setting is even better. Things that have a, a social component seem to be uh, really important. There's some very nice data on dancing. So if you compare a dance intervention to an intervention that has the same physical uh, difficulty, like cardiovascularly, um, there seems to be greater benefits for the brain in the dancing intervention. And that's maybe because there's uh, a social component, there's a coordination component. So it's not just the fact that you're physically active, there are all these other things that have additional benefits uh, uh, as well. So these complex tasks that require you to really try, try hard and learn and get better, you know, maybe fail occasionally, you know, practice, and then maybe there's a social component. Those seem to be the things that have this, you know, the greatest benefit for the brain. Yeah. Is there any sort of like dose frequency um, data? Like do we, you know, is once a week going to be enough for this? Obviously, I, I, I will just say, I think exercise is quite well known with regards to the benefits of exercise per se. But with these other things, if we're particularly thinking about cognitive demand on the brain. There's less less known about dose response, I think. Um, in reality, almost all studies have an intervention like two or three times a week. That seems to be like a, a standard intervention, just like in, in exercise intervention studies, that seems to be uh, seems to be the same. So I think that's probably a good starting point. So say you want to learn a new skill, you probably only have time to do it two or three times a week. And if you think about, well, how long am I going to spend doing it? You know, like an hour, but with probably 20 to 30 minutes of like really focused um, sort of like pushing the boundaries of what you're capable of. And, and if you think about most class type scenarios, that's essentially how it looks. So if you think if you've been in a language class or um, a martial arts class or, you know, a music lesson, you know, you spend some time warming up um, and then, you know, you spend some time like really working on a task and then you probably have a break in the middle and then you do that again. For most people, you know, the, this is kind of based in the, the theories of things like the Pomodoro technique. Like most people can probably only really focus for like 20 to 25 minutes, like a concerted effort at a time. You know, by the end of those 20, 25 minutes, you're probably feeling a little bit like cognitively fatigued, but maybe you've gotten a little frustrated because you're sort of tripping over your words or you can't get this passage of music right or you can't get this like movement pattern right. And then you have a bit, bit of a break and then you try again. And then that's probably the right amount of stimulus that then sort of, you know, over time, you'll, you'll build those skills. So I'm thinking an hour, three to four, sort of 20 to 30 uh, minute chunks, you know, a couple of times a week. Um, and, you know, that's, pro that's probably a good like, minimum effective dose. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Because it then, of course, allows you that recovery time that you talk about too, yeah. and allowing that sort of development. And I can see how uh, language as an intervention would also absolutely fall into that, like learning a new language. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Nice, Tommy. Um, and we haven't really talked about, I mean, we talked about blood sugar, but not necessarily about any nutrients or anything like that. And I don't know whether you look at stuff like this, but is there any relationship between cognitive decline and nutrient markers that we might easily be able to access? Like, what do you know about that, Tommy? Anything? Yeah. Uh, I think the, the two things that we have the best, so setting aside like markers of metabolic health, we've kind of covered that. Nutrient status, there are two things that I think we have some nice evidence for. They are homocysteine and omega-3 index. So there, there are some, homocysteine is, is basically a marker of your methylation and B vitamin status, roughly. Um, and there are some nice studies done um, 
the Vitacog and Optima studies done in Oxford. They have randomized controlled trials looking at people with elevated homocysteine levels. They had a, a level above 13 was their initial target. And they randomized them to, to get a really basic B vitamin supplement, like not even a very good one. It was a bit of folic acid, a bit of cyanocobalamin and some uh, B6. Um, and in that group, they saw a significant decrease in brain atrophy over time. You know, in people who had high homocysteine and homocysteine levels came down. They then saw an even greater benefit in those who had adequate omega-3 status. So you had to have enough circulating long-chain omega-3s, EPA and DHA, to get the maximum benefit from the, from the B vitamins. And a lot of that kind of makes sense if you think about how these things act in the brain, right? So we know that DHA is really important for the brain. It's It's had a bit of a temperamental relationship with Alzheimer's disease because they've tried studies that show that it did work or it didn't work in different populations. And that's because it doesn't act alone, right? Yeah. You don't just give DHA and it goes into the brain and it fixes everything, right? To get DHA into a membrane in the brain, it needs to be attached to a phosphate head, right? To become a phospholipid, to sit in a membrane. And the process of doing that requires adequate methylation. So to help DHA get where it needs to go in the brain, you need adequate B vitamin status. So homocysteine is a, is a good way to measure, measure that. So you need both. And that makes sense because you need the substrate and then you also need the, the mechanics to, to get it into the form that it needs to be in order to get into the membranes in the brain. There is another component which hasn't been looked at as much, but it has a little bit, which is choline. So choline um, has been shown to prevent some aspects of cognitive decline. And that's because choline is one of the ways that you can make a phosphate head for your phospholipid, right? So then you have your trifecta, you have the fatty acid, you have the head, and then you have the thing that brings them together, which is the B vitamins. So I think um, adequate omega-3 status, uh, checking your homocysteine and supplementing with B vitamins, um, uh, folate, B12, B6, and riboflavin. Um, if you have elevated homocysteine, I would, I would take those. Um, then, you know, some choline on top of that. That's that's probably a pretty good mix. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things that are important as well. I remember even, you know, more than 10 years ago when I was working in an elderly care ward in London, if somebody had a new diagnosis of dementia, we did, you know, the first thing we did was a dementia screen. So one is B vitamin status, um, but then things like vitamin D, iron, right? Those are very common, you know, deficiencies that that can be associated with cognitive decline. So even just like some super basic nutrient markers are probably worth doing as well. Yeah, no, that's super helpful, Tommy. In that, um, I find it really interesting with B twelve. Like if I I see clients and we get blood work done in the in New Zealand, the reference range for B twelve is anywhere from one hundred and ten to six hundred. And I see so many people in and around sort of that one sixty to two ten, two twenty. And um, and they experience brain fog, have really terrible energy, and uh, but it's not well recognised, I think, by other people looking at their labs, like their physicians or whatever. That there's that sort of relationship with those symptoms in B12. It just doesn't seem doesn't get a lot of airtime, I guess. Do you can you get a methyl malonic acid level? Yeah, you have to sort of push for it, but you can, and that would be a, a good determinant as well. Yeah, because because even uh, and again, uh, sometimes I'm, I'm amazed that we we did this because it's like in an NHS hospital in London. Yeah, if somebody was thought, you know, had, had lower end B12, the lab automatically did a methylmalonic acid, which is am amazing. And at the time, oh, wow. I didn't realize how important that was, but you know, ten years later, you you, you know, when you know more about it, you um, you can see that. So, methylmalonic for those who don't know. Methylmalonic acid is produced when you are functionally B12 deficient yeah. or in insufficient. So you can have like a borderline low B12 level, but if your methylmalonic acid is high, that tells you that your B12 level is insufficient for you to you know, have all the functions that B12 take, takes part in. That's such a great tip. And do you, um, I believe there are studies looking at people who follow a vegetarian based diet may well run lower in things like choline and b12 and, mm. and omegas and there is a, a relationship with that in cognition am i right in that tommy do you know much about that yeah unfortunately all the data is sort of epidemiological um so there's 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 nothing that's like really good so like the association between the markers themselves um and the outcomes i think are, are, are fairly good so um there is some epidemiological data to say those who are omnivores have 
better cognitive function later later in life. And my guess is that's nutrient related, um, like these nutrients that we're talking about, because in general, um, if you follow, say, a plant-based diet, unless you supplement, you may get less of these. That doesn't mean that everybody needs to, which is why I think it's just important if you can to test. Um, yeah. and, and I do think that the best plant-based diet proponents still do recommend that people at least supplement with b12 that's the one that oh, yeah. you know the, the the really you know good like smart people in that arena will still say you know regardless of everything else you probably should take a b12 supplement and I, I would agree yeah no that makes perfect sense so tommy if people are sort of oh no i do actually have one last question dale brennison dale yeah. brennison is dale his, yeah and his 36 um strategies to help prevent or manage Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever looked into that protocol? Do you have any thoughts on it? It's very intensive, quite probably quite expensive and all of that. Like what is it evidence-based? So I, I'm actually formally trained in his, in his protocol. Oh, wow. I did, I did so the training a, a few years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, D <coughs> Dale is this amazing person who used to be this like properly hardcore neuroscientist who would publish in all the fancy journals and and you know did did a whole bunch of like really basic neuroscience and Alzheimer's disease and and you know now is out there you know t telling people about diet and meditation and all these different things related to which I think is which I think that trajectory of his career is just incredible. Um, the the main issue, and, and and I'll say this because I'm pretty sure I've said this to him in, in person as well. So I'm not just like, this isn't an absentee hatsu job where I like no, say no. bad things about him. Um, yeah. Like you intimate, it's very, it's very complicated and it's very expensive. Like if you're going to do all the tests that you, he would like optimally recommend, it can run into the, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. There's a lot of really great stuff in there. And I would say that the majority of things that his protocol would recommend are great and the majority of the things that will have what i believe to be the biggest benefit do not require a bunch of expensive testing yeah so the thing that's not known and he acknowledges this i, I know in the conversations i've had with him the the thing that that's not known is the relic so right if you have 36 or was it i think it's 42 I, anyway if you have dozens of different things that you're told are important, like all the, he has this like holes in a roof model, right? You're, you know, yes. you're still going to have a, a wet floor unless you plug all the holes in all your roof, them. right? You can't just plug one. And that, that makes sense. Mm. And it does make sense. But the thing is, we don't know the size of the different holes. You know what I mean? Like what's the relative effect of each of these? And the only way to test that, unfortunately, is with a very complex and large and expensive clinical trial. Because you might say randomize people to fix each of the 42 holes and then see how they respond and then randomize them again and fix the next hole and the next hole, right? And that the, the, there are clinical trial designs where we can do that, but it would cost a whole ton of money and nobody's giving Dale any money to, to test these interventions. Unfortunately, if I was in charge of the NIH budget, I'd give him millions of dollars and he can just test this stuff because I think yeah. it, the potential for impact is massive. So we don't know like what's the most important thing that we can address and how important are each of these things relatively and how common are each of these things relatively like here's one like super niche thing that may affect a very tiny proportion of people you know who are those people that kind of stuff yeah so yeah, yeah. i would say that when dale makes recommendations about uh, diet and nutrients and sleep and physical activity uh cognitive stimulus he, he talks about that all of that stuff is great um, and, and, you know, I, f I fully believe in it, the sort of the more nuanced and niche testing and supplements and stuff like that, I'm less bought into so far, just because I, I don't know the relative magnitude of their benefit. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, that totally makes sense. And it's sort of like, as we started our conversation, thinking about, um, the, the big picture diet, lifestyle, sleep, recovery, all those quite simple things which are a bit boring yeah they're sort of important regardless and they're achievable by hopefully a lot of people who are interested in this stuff exactly and i think if you're if you're trying to think about like what's going to have the biggest effect at a population level right if you fix all of those things of course there are going to be some people where you have to do a whole bunch of more niche diagnostics and testing and supplements and stuff like that like it's that's not going to fix everybody, but like I think that's going to be our like Pareto principle. We'll get eighty percent of the benefit by doing that in everybody, and like that's where I want to start. 
And then, you know, there are going to be practitioners and experts who are, and some of whom are my good friends who are, who specialize in this, the people who don't respond to that or need extra stuff. And there's always yeah. going to be those people. But if we're tr- thinking about the big, like fix those big rocks first. And I think for most people, that's going to have, you know, enough of a benefit that you'll see like a meaningfully different outcome. Yeah, no, perfect, Tommy. Finally, you've got like, to, someone is willing to take on board two of your sort of suggestions to help improve their cognitive function and they already have a pretty good diet so what are you going to tell them to do um lift weights yeah. and dance great well it's together <laughs> like some sort of like musical some sort of like i mean you know, um, um, gym maybe, musical. maybe. this is yeah. like crossfit the musical <laughs> yeah <laughs> Some, some, something like that. Um, That's a working idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, or you could you could also uh, you could also swap out. Yeah, if you're lifting weights, you could swap out dance for another complex but social skill. So yeah. then I would put um, musical instruments and language. Probably, it probably is my top ones. Go to, awesome. go to go to music class. Go to a dance class. Join an orchestra. Like some, something like that. Go and be bad at something with other people yeah. and laugh about it. That's fantastic. And in fact, that makes me want to go to like do like Italian lessons. And then, of course, I'll have good reason then to go to Italy as well. And yeah. Being in that environment, that's got to be good for my brain. Exactly. Go and go to Sicily and hang out with yes. all the super centenarians. Yeah. Amazing. Tommy, thank you so much for your time this morning. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, where can people find you and your research? Um, probably the best place is Instagram at Dr. Tommy Wood on Instagram. Um, there's a lot of your uh, dogs on, uh, uh, there's a lot of my dogs there. I, yeah. me and, uh, Josh and I just started a new podcast called better brain fitness. Amazing. Um, so the, the only reason that happened is because Josh is very organized and good at that kind of stuff. So I just show up and answer questions and then he does the rest. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so better brain fitness podcast, I will post more about that on social media soon. I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, but it's, it's a Q and a format. So there's one first episode where we kind of describe the paper that you mentioned and all this cognitive stimulus stuff. But then after that, people can either post like record themselves asking a question or type in a question and then every week we'll we'll answer a different question so if you have a question and you think other people might like the answer to that question find the podcast there'll be a link submit your question and then i can answer it for you but then i can also answer it for everybody else amazing i will pop that link in the show notes as well tommy thanks so much enjoy the rest of your day you too thank, thanks thanks also it's great to be back Hopefully you really loved that as much as I loved chatting to Tommy. He's, as I said, a complete wealth of information, super funny, and um, really is able to put across what he knows in such an accessible way. So, um, yeah, I enjoyed doing that. Next week on the podcast, we speak to Andrew Best or Drew Best on metabolic adaptation and energy expenditure. Until next week, though, you can catch me over on Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition, over on Instagram and Twitter at Mickey Willardin, or head to my website, mickeywillardin.com, where you can sign up to a plan or book a one-on-one nutrition call with me so I can help optimize your performance in life and sport. All right, team, have a great week. <laughs>